Welcome to this podcast entitled Molecular Orbital Theory 2. I hope you recall some of the concepts we talked about in Molecular Orbital Theory 1. And I might add at this point that Molecular Orbital Theory is very difficult to understand. And it may be the case that you don't understand some or even all of what we're talking about in this particular discussion. But as you see this more and more, you will see this again at the undergraduate level. Uh, you will eventually get to have a sense of what we're talking about here. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, from the last concept, last podcast, we talked about some of the key concepts, and that being that bonding electrons are localized between atoms or our lone pairs. And you should have seen a little bit of this with the electron density lab, that for us to have a bond, we have to have electrons localized between two of the bonding uh, atoms. So what you saw in the electron density lab is that as you have more electron density in between the atoms, you have shorter bonds and you also have stronger bonds. You should also be starting to understand that atomic orbitals overlap to form bonds. So we take an atomic orbital, like an S orbital on a hydrogen, and we overlap it with an S orbital, say, on another hydrogen, that forms a molecular orbital and that is forms what we call the bond. You also need to understand that two electrons of opposite spin can occupy the overlapping orbitals. And you should understand that bonding increases the probability of finding electrons in between atoms. And again, going back to the electron density lab, you should see how the electron density changes uh, depending on whether it's a single, double, or triple bond. And it's also possible, by the way, for atoms to form ionic and metallic bonds. We're not going to talk a whole lot about that here. We're really going to be talking mostly about what we call covalent bonding. Okay, so in molecular orbital theory, obviously there are some rules, um, such as combination of some number of atomic orbitals gives you the same number of molecular orbitals. So if we add two atomic orbitals, for example, one hydrogen atomic orbital plus one hydrogen atomic orbital, uh, that's two atomic orbitals. That will give us two MOs, or two um, molecular orbitals. The molecular orbitals are arranged in order of increasing energy, just like the SPD uh, filling that you have probably seen. And again, we follow what's called the Aufbau principle. We fill beginning in the lowest energy. Uh, the Pauli exclusion principle says we can't have any more than two electrons in a molecular orbital. And Hund's rule says when two or more molecular orbitals of, a, of equivalent uh, are of equivalent energy, uh, we add one electron to each before filling any of them with two electrons. Okay, and we'll get a chance to take a look at that uh, during this week. Okay, molecular orbital theory: the MOs are derived by a combination either by addition of or subtraction of two atomic orbitals. And what you're seeing uh, in the picture is what I've already mentioned a little bit already in this conversation. Notice there on the bottom left, I have a red uh, 1s orbital, that's hydrogen, and I combine it with another uh, hydrogen 1s orbital. And those two orbitals, notice by the way, that red overlaps red and blue overlaps blue, but red does not overlap blue. And notice there, the two reds will overlap and they will form a molecular orbital which has a lower energy value than the two atomic orbitals all by themselves. Going up to the top there, again, if you look over to the right, I have a blue 1s orbital and a red 1s orbital. And because these are in different phases, remember blue means the up part of the wave and the red means the down part of the wave, because these are in different phases, they don't overlap they will form what's called an anti-bonding orbital. And you see what that picture looks like up top there. You see both sort of the cartoon picture and you see what you would see on the computational chemistry server. So that's how, so this whole idea of a molecular or an atomic orbital overlapping another orbital is the basis of molecular orbital theory. Okay, so a bonding molecular orbital is a molecular orbital in which electrons have a lower energy than they would have in isolated atomic orbitals. So again, if you looked at the hydrogen, the two individual 1s orbitals have high energy. If we can overlap them, they will now have a lower energy, and that's a good thing. We always want a lower energy, and that would form a bond. So a sigma bonding molecular orbital is an MO in which the electron density is concentrated between two nuclei 
along the axis joining them and is cylindrically symmetrical. And again, you saw several examples of sigma bonding in the electron density lab. So what you were looking at there between the two carbon atoms in that lab was the sigma bonding between the two carbons. Okay, so in covalent bonding, we can draw a, a picture of this. So this is what's called a molecular orbital energy diagram. And the one on the left there is for simply hydrogen. Notice I have hydrogen with one electron on the left. I have another hydrogen with one electron on the right. And the molecular orbital diagram says that those two will overlap and form a sigma bond. And we call that a sigma 1s with both electrons. And again, what you need to pay attention to is the fact that the, the two electrons combined give us a lower energy value than the single electrons in each of the two atoms. I also show you, I'm not exactly sure why, but also showed you an excited state here. So what we've done is we've promoted one of these electrons uh, to uh, a sigma star orbital. That's called an antibonding orbital, by the way. And when we have an excited state, we will have no bonding because a sigma orbital cancels out a sigma star orbital. So those two electrons sort of cancel each other out. And in the excited state, what that means is we would no longer have a bond between the two hydrogens. Okay, and so antibonding MO is an MO in which the electrons have a higher energy than they would in an isolated atomic orbital. And you saw that in the last picture. Okay, some of you may have run into this idea of hybridization. And the one way to think about it maybe is to think about automobiles. You have gasoline-powered cars, you have electrical-powered cars, and both of them have some real disadvantages. Uh, and so what's the solution? Well, of course, the solution is to have a hybrid car. And a hybrid car is part gasoline and part electrical, and that's what we have now. So if you buy a Prius or uh, I'm not sure what the other brands are, but those are hybrid cars, so they are partly gasoline-powered and partly electrical powered. Likewise, in chemistry, it turns out that uh, we have to hybridize orbitals uh, to help describe exactly what we're seeing. So, so as it says here, the number of hybrid orbitals formed is equal to the number of, of atomic orbitals combined. And we have special designations for these hybrid orbitals. So uh, we don't need to spend too much time on it, but if you take a look at this, uh, this picture here, I've, I've got a, on the right here, or excuse me, on the left, a 2s and a 2p electron configuration. So there's two electrons in the 2s. There's one electron each in two of the three p orbitals. And what happens is it turns out that the, the atom really prefers a different energy configuration. So we'll take two of the s's and two of the p's and we will morph them together and now what we have is what's called an sp3 hybrid. So we take purely s and purely p and we hybridize them a little bit of each and that forms what's called an sp3 hybrid. Okay, And that's what allows, by the way, carbon to form four single bonds. So when you look at carbons with single bonds, they are going to be sp3 hybrids. Okay, And here we have some pretty pictures of them. So there's a cartoon on the left of what an sp3 orbital looks like. Notice it's not as quite symmetrical as it used to be uh, before. A p orbital was uh, half blue and half red. Now it's one, one fourth or so or one eighth blue and a, and a lot more red. So uh, because these atomic orbitals hybridize or sort of morph shape a little bit, that's what allows these molecules to uh, become stable. So what you need to understand from this is all singly bonded carbon atoms are what's known as sp3 hybrids. Okay, And we can do this same thing. Um, we can hybridize things a little bit differently, and this is now going to form what's called an sp2 hybrid. And the, the big thing that you have to remember is if you see a carbon with a double bond, any carbon that has a double bond on it, that carbon is an sp2 hybrid. Okay, So single bonded carbons are sp3s, double bonded uh, carbons are sp2s. And here are some cartoons of what these things look like. Uh, notice the sp2 has a little bit more blue on it than the sp3 did, and a little less red. 
and what we're showing you here in this graphic is some of the bond angles between these. You did a little bit of that with the geometry lab that we did last week. Okay, um, and uh, likewise, there's what's now known as an SP hybrid. And again, as you might suspect, uh, sp3 hybrids form for carbons when you have triple bonds. So if you have a single bonded carbon, that's going to be an sp3 hybrid. If you have a double bond carbon, that's going to be an sp2 hybrid. And if you have a triple bond uh, carbon, that's going to be an sp hybrid. You can even go back to your electron density lab and confirm that that is indeed the case because I gave you a single bonded carbon, a double bonded carbon, and a triple bonded carbon, and I think I even asked you to find the hybridization on there, but uh, this is the graphic of why that happens. The important thing to know for moving on to the next level, especially those of you taking MedChem, is the single bonded carbon is sp3, double bonded is sp2, and triple bonded is sp3. Okay. And again, here's pictures of that. Notice that the, the shapes are changing a little bit. The other two graphics, by the way, show the linear uh, bond angles and some of the geometries of that. And you can look at those and try to see if those make any sense. Okay, so what happens is when we, in something like uh, a carbon-carbon single bond, we've got a, so if you look, we've got a, on the left there, the, uh, you see the sp3 hybrid carbon and then over on the right you see the sp3 carbon uh, hybrid so you see the two carbons and notice that we have red a big red lobe uh, facing a, a big red lobe and because red overlaps with red we can overlap those together and that forms the uh, molecular orbital that you see down the very bottom of this graphic with the two little blue blobs there and a big red blob in the middle. So I hope you can can imagine how we would take the two sp3 hybrids, overlap them, and that's going to form what's called the sigma bond. If you look up at the top there, if, if I turn them around and I have uh, red facing blue and blue facing red, notice that they will, uh, they will not overlap and I get what's called the anti-bonding orbital. Okay, so that would not be a bond that would be an anti-bonding orbital. Remember, reds overlap reds, blues overlap blues, reds do not overlap blues. And again, remember the red and blue refer to the uh, up and down part of the wave. Okay. So again, double bond uses sp2 hybridization. If we look at ethylene or ethene, that's C2H4, um, we will get uh, have a combination of sp2 hybrids and the unhybridized 2p orbitals to form double bonds. So here's a picture uh, in letter A. It shows you what ethene looks like. And again, you looked at this with the electron density lab. And what you should see here is the carbon-carbon sigma bond forming from an overlap of two sp2 orbitals. So I'm using, looks like I have gray overlapping gray. As long as the colors are the same, uh, we, can, uh, we can overlap them. We also form here a what's called a pi bond. So if you notice there, I have two blue lobes facing down at the bottom and two red lobes facing up. Well, the two reds overlap and the two blues overlap. Again, I hope you can sort of see how they would overlap each other. And collectively, now this is where a lot of people get confused. The reds overlapping and the blues overlapping doesn't form two bonds. It forms a, just one bond. So what you're seeing here, if you look at the carbon-carbon double bond, one of those bonds there is the gray sigma bond. That's why we colored it differently. We colored it gray here so you could see it. So one of those bonds in the double bond is the gray sigma bond. The other bond is the blue-red pi bond. Okay, Remember that pi bond is formed by both of these orbitals overlapping. The red overlaps the red, the blue overlaps the blue, and collectively the red and the blue overlaps equal one bond. I hope that makes sense. We'll try to draw a picture of that during video conference so you get to see that a little bit clearer. Okay, So here's what this would look like. Notice we have, we're just showing the pi bonds here. So I have a carbon uh, pi bond, red on the top, blue on the bottom. On the other side I have a pi, uh, p orbital, red on the top, blue on the bottom. I can overlap them and form what's called the pi bond uh, down below. Notice red overlaps red, 
blue overlaps blue. And again, the really important thing to remember here is that double overlap, red over red and blue over blue, does not create two bonds. It only creates one bond. Okay. If you look at the top there, what the anti-bonding orbital looks like, red doesn't overlap with blue, blue doesn't overlap with red, so I get an anti-bonding orbital there, and that's what happens in, in, in ethene. Okay, and where am I going next? And then a triple bond. Uh, we've got the sigma bond there in the middle with the reds, and now we can form, it's really hard to see here, we have two blues and two reds, so they're all overlapping with each other. So I have two pairs of blues and two pairs of reds, and collectively that gives me three bonds. So if I look at the triple bond in between the carbons, one of those bonds is a sigma bond, the other two are each pi bond. So I have one sigma and two pi bonds in a double bond. Okay, and we'll take a look at that again a little bit more clearly. Okay, so there's, uh, again, all kinds of, of hybridization. We talked about this, and again, uh, looking at this here, uh, sp3 hybrids you should have seen in the molecular geometry lab. The tetrahedral is uh, four Vesper groups. sp2 is trigonal planar. sp is linear. And it shows you here uh, a little bit what the orbitals look like. So we have sp3 in single bonds. We have sp2s in double bonds. And we have sp3s in either triple bonds or in two double bonds. Notice I have C, uh, the carbon there, with two double bonds on either side. That would also be an sp hybridized carbon. And it tells you there the number of pi bonds that you see. Uh, zero for sp3, two for, or excuse me, one for sp2 and two for SP, okay? And all of this stuff will, we will use hybridization to explain geometry. So we can really use uh, how these molecular orbitals overlap to help explain geometry. So we match up the P orbitals for the pi, and excuse me, I mean to go back, and what we find out from this particular molecule because of how the orbitals line up, that will tell us that this is fundamentally a linear molecule and at least until we get to the hydrogens on either end. It's also going to be the case that we can use these molecular orbital theories to talk about how we, how molecules react. And that part we'll do in the video conference because it's a lot easier to uh, show that by drawing it by hand rather than in slides. So if you have any questions, we'll see you on video conference and we look forward to seeing you online.